Hi there. This is Brother Richard. And today, <coughs> continuing <coughs> with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery, this will be part 408. We're looking at a lesson titled, Division of Authority. <coughs> Division of authority. Scripture teaches the Father has delegated the administration of all his creations, <coughs> whether primary or secondary, to angels to administer. Turn to Colossians, the first chapter, verse 16. And we see there that they're created to administer the creations. <coughs> For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible. So we see <coughs> that the earth is described as not a planet. It is a matrix which contains many different intelligences, <coughs> visible and invisible, as does the heavens. <coughs> he proceeds to talk about some of these. Whether they be thrones, the word thrones comes from a Greek term thronos, which means authorities. <coughs> or dominions, the word dominions comes from a Greek term kuriotes, which means lords. Or principalities. Principalities comes from a Greek term arche, which means chief ruler, or powers. Powers comes from a Greek term exousia, which means authorities. All things were created by him <coughs> and for him. <coughs> they were created to run his, to uh, administer, if you will, his creations. We see an example of that. Turn to Daniel, fourth chapter. <clears throat> Daniel, the fourth chapter. Here, <clears throat> we're going to look at a dream <clears throat> that the Babylonian king has. Starting in <coughs> verse <coughs> 13, and we're going to read down to verse 17. King tells Daniel the dream that he has. <coughs> I saw in the visions of my head and upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a an holy one came down from heaven. Here he's referring to two angelic groups. One group called the Watchers, the other group called the Holy Ones, which are not even mentioned in Paul's pantheon. So we see that Paul is only giving us a, a, a portion of the hierarchy of administrative intelligences that have been created to basically <coughs> administer the vast creations of God. Refresh my memory again. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for a watcher to be a fallen being? Because I thought they, I thought they were fallen and unfallen. Well, we know that in, in the families, some are fallen, some aren't. Mm -hmm. Cherubim, uh, all the lower angels, for the most part, <coughs> um, I would say, not all of them. 
You have old groups that never fell. Okay. Would the watches be one of those groups? In I, don't, I don't think the watches are falling. Okay. And I'm assuming holy ones didn't fall? No. Because of the holy? Yeah. But you have beings out here claiming to be of the watcher group. Right. The Book of Enoch has a twist hmm? around. The Book of Enoch talks about the watcher. Right. Yes, yes. I came across that. That's why I'm thinking about that. Yeah. I, I don't give any credence to the Book of no, Enoch. No, of course not. <clears throat> but let's go on. <clears throat> I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. And he, the watcher, cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, <clears throat> cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, <coughs> In the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his, be, let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's heart. Let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. <coughs> so the <coughs> watcher is pronouncing a judgment on the king. <coughs> and then he goes on, <coughs> verse 17, This matter is by the decree. The word decree in the Hebrew means just that. Decree of the watchers and the demand. The word demand there means decision by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basis of men. So we see <clears throat> that the angelic groups are given authority to administer the creation, the heavens and the earth. Now since the watchers from the Holy One <coughs> also sit on the sides of the north, mm -hmm. am I correct in thinking that they have no business with YHVH, they report directly to Elohim or the Father? It depends. Hmm. I, I think <coughs> Elohim probably oversees the uh, congregation in the sides of the North. Okay. Because he's the head, head, head being of all things. over all the angelic uh, hosts. And since he's given authority over all of the secondary creation and had authority before that to administer from the primary creation, I would assume that he oversees the, uh, <coughs> the congregation in the sides of the north. Okay. Now, <coughs> Scripture teaches in the age to come, it is at the end of this age, the beginning of the millennial age, the angels will not be the administrators of all the Father's creations. <clears throat> Turn to Hebrews, second chapter, verse 5. Hebrews, second chapter, verse 5. <clears throat> For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world, where world there is age, the age to come whereof we speak. So in the age to come, the angels that were created to oversee and administer the creations will not be in that position. Well, when you say in that position, they will still work for the Prototicus, the sons of God. Uh, yes, <clears throat> but that means that they will only be administering indirectly. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, verse 3. <clears throat>
Yes. Yes. First Corinthians, <coughs> sixth chapter. Verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more <coughs> things that pertain to this life? Now this is un, un, this is uh, all inclusive. Sure. <coughs> he's not saying we should judge some angels. He's saying all, all of them. Right. So the sons of God retain you. Know, the direction of the angels, but the angels will still be doing certain things that they were doing previously, just not making decisions, as I've understood it. Well, we have to understand it's going to be a total change, radical change. Yes. Okay. This occurred to me earlier. I'll speak it out now. It seems as if the Father is putting a higher order of rulership the, uh, over the creation. Yes. Removing the lesser, putting in the greater. which we can add to that to say, when the angelic hierarchy was created <coughs> and administered in the different groups, it was not meant to be permanent. Mm. This is all done from the perspective of the sons of God making their entrance into and ultimately dominating all things. So should we understand that the created angels, the flappy, flappy wing angels as I call them, mm -hmm. um, were not told that they weren't going to hold positions for any given period of time. They just knew whatever the father wanted them to know. That's it. That's it. <coughs> but the key, the key to all this is that they will know that the sons of God are indeed the sons of God. And then now to take directions from the rulership level that he's talking about. I would say <coughs> the fallen angels already know that. Remember what the scripture says. Are they not all Ministering spirit. <coughs> ministering spirit sent forth to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Right. They already know. They already know, okay. <coughs> so they can pretend as much as they like. They already know. Well, they don't know the full story, <laughs> but they right. know along with the creation, there's going to be a regime change here. <coughs> Radical regime change. Mr. Jones, let me just add to this. We know there's going to be a celebration when the sons are revealed. And because what you guys just now said, because finally somebody is going to put this in correct order and we are going to rule with them. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I think they're looking forward to it. <coughs> now. Scripture teaches the angels <coughs> who today are administrators of the creations will themselves be under the administration of the sons of God. We just read that, 1 Corinthians 6, 3. The next principle, <clears throat> Scripture teaches many of the angel groups have been unfaithful to their calling. There has been a tremendous display of ineptitude, of <clears throat> lack of commitment on the part of many angelic groups, mm. which leads to, yes. So the question is, I think you just now answered it, is it more out of one particular family of angels or is it widespread? No, across the board. Across the board. We're going to see <clears throat> some examples of that. Jude, verse 6. Jude, 
and the angels which kept not their first estate. The word first there is primary. Estate. In other words, their primary function. But left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting change in the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. <clears throat> For others are very displeased <clears throat> because they abandoned the thing they were created to do. <clears throat> Ministering from their habitations, regions of the creation, <clears throat> they totally abandoned them and took off for other parts. So would you call that insubordination? Certainly. Okay. At the highest level. Yes. <clears throat> Turn to Psalms 82, verse 1 to 7. <clears throat> God standeth in the congregation of the mighty gods. He judgeth among the gods. So you can look at this and you can see this has nothing to do with the human race whatsoever. <clears throat> and it's difficult to understand why people haven't seen it from this perspective to begin with. Well, they said that the gods are uh, magistrates. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. They're just not human magistrates. I like that. <clears throat> How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. So what we find a principle here, when these individuals were put into the position that they're put into, which is after the fall of Lucifer, they were put in to do what they're not doing. YHVH is castigating them. He said, why do, if they were fallen from the beginning, they would never be expected to do what he's telling them they're not doing. So they've corrupted their positions of authority. Widespread. <clears throat> Deliver the poor and needy, <clears throat> rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All, A-L-L, -L, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Neglecting their, it, this is the thing they were created to do. Thrones, dominions, principalities. <clears throat> the essence of the, it's like <clears throat> you forsaking the craft that you were created to perform. The father's very displeased in this. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he goes on to say, I have said you're gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So again, they're not human. <clears throat> they are the thrones, dominions, principalities, <clears throat> cherubim, high order beings created to administer God's creations. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, <clears throat> for thou shalt inherit all nations. <clears throat> so we're looking here at, the, the Bible is giving us a rendition of, of not just the human race, it's the or, origin and its destiny. It's giving us a running account of the activities of non-humans, whether on earth or in the heavens, <clears throat> the things they have done and the destiny that awaits them, along with the humans. <clears throat> Jeremiah, 10th chapter, verse 11. <clears throat> A judgment on them.
Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth. The word made there is a Hebrew term, <coughs> asha, which means to do. So what he's saying here, the guys that have not performed their duty, the guys that have not administered what they were called to administer, <coughs> a judgment is pronounced upon them. That have not made the heavens and the earth, they have not kept, they have not administered the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. This is why we are doing what we're doing, dealing with the fourth empire. The Father <coughs> is going to bring about judgment on all the gods and the humans that have transgressed. His master plan is set in motion after the adoption of his sons to the fullness of sonship. Then he will turn and begin to inaugurate his master plan for the downfall of all these recalcitrant intelligences. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches the Father has from eternity divided the prototokus sons into two groups. <coughs> One group will rule and the other group will instruct the creations. Scripture indicates the group that will rule will deliver the creation into the hand of those that will instruct it. Romans, the 8th chapter, <coughs> verses 19 to 21. For the earnest expectation of the creature, creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The creation is anticipating <coughs> the manifestation of its deliverers, been doing so for over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him, who has subjected the same in hope as part of the Father's plan, because the creature, creation, itself, shall be delivered, shall be delivered. Who's going to do the delivering? The sons of God. The rulers. Mm -hmm. The king. The elders, okay. Delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Who is going to administer the liberty to the creation? The priests. Priest class. They're going to bring it into an understanding of its purpose, restore the lost capacity that it had to function, which is taken away from it by its fall, and then bring it into higher levels of comprehending purpose, its creator, <coughs> and its destiny. Now, what we find, <clears throat> you're in Romans 8, 29 to 30. For whom he did foreknow, meaning whom he had a relationship with before, he also did predestinate, conform to the image of his son, that he, his son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. <coughs> he became firstborn. Psalms, the second chapter. I will declare the decree that I said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Firstborn. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. <coughs> Word called there comes 
from a Greek term meaning to beckon, to summon into his presence. Why? Because he's calling them to confer something upon them. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Whom he called them, he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. What does this mean? In between what you're reading here, justified and glorified is also sanctified. He determined what group they would fall under. Chris, I'm calling you. Come. You're going to be a priest. Brace, I'm calling you. Come. You're going to be a priest. John, I'm calling you. Come. You're going to be an elder. Each one was given his place in the prototokus scheme of things at the time he was called. Now turn to Revelation, second chapter. How do we know it was at the time he was called and not before when the Father did the predestination? Or because you say the time of calling is the predestination? Yes. Okay, okay, yes. okay. He's speaking what he's predetermined right. upon that son. Revelation 2nd chapter verse 26 and 27 <clears throat> And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now the he that he's talking about, that is going to be the overcomer, is the one that the Father called and designated what part of the group he would be in. So he's talking about the individual that's called to be an elder is going to fall under this promise. When you were called in eternity, the Father designated you as an elder. You overcome. Your destiny is going to be this. <clears throat> I will give him power, authority over the nations. I will give him authority over the nations. The person is already designated. When he enters into the adoption, he's going to get this designation, this power, this authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. So that person that's been called, everything has been bestowed upon him. The only thing he has to do is to be obedient to his call. In this life, he's going to have experiences that are designed to develop his ability to rule, to administer. The one that's called to be priest, Revelation 3rd chapter. <clears throat> verse, verse 12. Him that overcometh, the one that's called to be priest, Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? He will go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him my new name. Now this is one aspect of the priest hierarchy, a pillar angel carrying the name of the Father, making declarations authoritatively out of New Jerusalem in which when he speaks it, it, it encompass, encompasses all things that pertain to what he has said because he's not speaking of himself he's speaking of the Father turn to Ephesians <clears throat> first chapter we'll be closing with this First chapter, verse 3 to verse 5. 
talking about what the Father did in Romans 8, 29 and 30. <coughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, hath blessed us, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, having blessed us, because you're called in Eparanios. You're blessed in Eparanios. You're given marching orders in Eparanios. When he beckoned the Son to himself, he first willed that angel to be a son on the level of a son, and then he calls him to himself to confer upon him his destiny as the Son. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Predetermined. What goes with the adoption? Fullness of sonship. What goes with the fullness of sonship? Your specific place in the scheme of things. Having predestinated us unto, <clears throat> us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So he bestowed everything at that point in time upon the Prototokos sons. And then he calls them around his throne to sit until the time when they're going to descend into the levels of creation to have experiences that ultimately will qualify them for the adoption. This is the path we're on. If we're obedient, we're almost at the finish line here. We we'll go on across victorious. Yes. Okay, Brother Jones. I got a question for you. It's not pertaining to this lesson. So the one we had last night. And I want to be sure that I understand it perfectly well. And it's pertaining to my robe. I know Jesus is coming for a robe without spot or blemish. Mm -hmm. I also know that Jesus paid for my sins, so my robe is washed clean because I accept him as my Lord and Savior. Okay. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, can I spot my robe? Easily. Okay. What must I do to make sure I'm not spotting my robe? Turn to John, 15th chapter. Jesus speaks about people that start off ultimately spotting their robes, and he speaks about the position they bring upon themselves when they do that. John 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So, <clears throat> Immediately, if a person's robe is spotted, he's not going to be bearing fruit. He's not going to be functioning the way he's designed to function. That's the first thing. Then he goes on. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So the person that's spotless because he's abiding totally in the Lord is going to go through hell because the things he's endured the Father's going to turn the heat up on so that he can become more than he currently is. If you're not experiencing the sufferings of Christ it's a problem. Let's go on. <clears throat> now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. Now, the difference between Christianity and the religions is one basic description. In Christ, it's not 
a, 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 a state of doing, it is a state of being. Mm -hmm. A branch that's abiding in the, <coughs> the tree is doing nothing. It's staying connected. And that position of being connected is what makes it able to function to its fullest. He never, never, never talks about doing. He's consistently talking about being. Either you are connected or you are not connected. A person that spots his robe has severed his connection. Whether fully or partially. It depends upon what he did to spot the robe. The Holy Spirit will let him know what his position is. You establish your connection. Notice what it goes on to say if he doesn't. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot abide, cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me. In other words, the Laodiceans reached the point where their robes weren't spotted. They were totally destroyed. A total severance of the connection. He says, if a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. A person that continues, the robe doesn't just stay spotted. It gets blotched. It gets to a point where it's no longer functioning. It doesn't exist anymore. And the person is wide open to the Luciferian influence, ultimately total separation and judgment. Each individual has to examine his own position. Is he totally connected? Is he partially connected? Or is he separated? It depends on the individual. <clears throat>